Jo. Right. We go to treat for you guys. Um, I'd like to introduce the unintroducible Mr. Ben Supper. Um, ben, I've known for a few years. We've quite literally worked together. He's, it's literally been a job. <laughs> We've been colleagues. It's been fine. Um, my, uh, I think my favorite talk with Ben was last year's um, five minute long ranting meltdown lightning talk, half talk, half suicide note, stream of consciousness ramble. Um, hopefully the talk today won't be quite as, um, as interesting as that one, but it will be about spatialization. Now, I don't think the world has enough spatialization algorithms yet. So luckily, Ben's here to tell you all about the psychoacoustics of how it all works. So you can all go off and write another hundred or so spatialization algorithms for the, for uh, well, wherever they go. So with no more, no further ado, Mr. Ben Supper. Hello, and, and thanks for coming, and thanks for the introduction, Jules. One of the perils of presenting at ADC is um, I'm up against three other talks, which are also worth going to. Um, there's never a bad moment here, so um, thank you for coming. I know it's been a conscious choice, and I'll try not to let you down, but who knows what happens when the adrenaline descends. Okay, so the first thing I'll get out of the way is a couple of caveats. The first one, Al Jolson here, representing hand-waving. Um, one of the, when I pitched this talk, one of the um, reviewers was worried that this might be quite a hand-wavy talk without, um, without much kind of mathematical or technical rigor. To which I reply, well, talking about spatialization is really trying to condense probably 12 hours worth of lectures into a, into a single one hour slot. So you will catch interesting things out of the corner of your eye, I hope. And so will I, that we'll just have to kind of gloss over or put back in their box. Um, and by necessity, trying to scope this down to an hour will involve a little bit of hand waving, but I hope not too much. The second thing is what I'm talking to you about pertains to, loud, um, pertains to headphone listening only, really. Headphones are the kind of the natural vector for this stuff to happen because you can control exactly what happens to the left and right ears. There's no more processing, no more complications than that. You just squeeze signals into left channel and right channel and, um, and you can control pretty well what's happening to within about 60 decibels, which is lovely for an audio engineer. I like the fact there's a shop called Headphone Shop. Apparently this is in Korea. Um, I might have to go. So. The first question really is kind of inferred that there's a lot out there at the moment. Um, virtual reality last year or the year before that was where AI is now. It was something that companies were piling an awful lot of money into to try and make things happen. And um, all the big tech companies bought up all these little tech companies and, and kind of chose their winners for spatialization algorithms. And everyone's got APIs now that do this stuff already. So the question is either why create another one or why decide what's out there at the moment isn't really adequate. And, um, the answer to that question is, um, well, what do you want? There's a, firstly, there's a whole gamut of quality things that you might, you might require. So um, I suppose that the, at the top of the bucket list is a simulation indistinguishable from reality, where you put this thing on somebody's head and, and their audio part is transported to a different environment, um, and they don't feel at all kind of compromised by that illusion. What's more achievable and what is perhaps more desirable in this world where technology is becoming increasingly creepy is just to support a willing suspension of disbelief. The same thing that happens when someone listens to a radio drama and they know that actors are acting, right? You put this thing on your head and it's not exactly right, but it doesn't have to be. The cues are there and they support your illusion well enough that you don't get bothered by what you're listening to. Um, something just good enough to sell a product. So if you're working in a very low ceilinged environment or you don't have much money to spend on your hardware, um, what, what would be good enough for your application? And, that will probably change depending on what the application is. And it's very unlikely you'll be able to buy something off the shelf that's good in just the right way and crap but cheap in just the right way. And, and, and mi mixing those two things together, you may want to roll your own. Um, and, and also your own product or something to license. So it depends on what you're working on and whether or not you think you've missed a boat in terms of, um, of building something to sell to other people that isn't a completed product that's just an API or something they can drop in. So that's the first what do you want slide. Um, before we get to actually what this talk is about, the second what do you want slide, um, are people going to be wearing this thing all day? So augmented reality is this thing where people are permanently plugged into their mobile phones and um, the stream that's naturally spilling into their ears and the environment is supplemented by some other information about the environment that you're generating. Um, 
if that happens, there are certain considerations that you have to take into account about cognition in general. Um, the cues have to be right. Um, if you think about seasickness and where that comes from, that comes from a conflict of what your visual senses are telling you and what the semicircular canals in your middle ear are telling you. And when you have those things in, com in conflict for any length of time, um, your body starts to tell you that you've been poisoned and you eject stuff from you in order to purge yourself of it. And actually, if you put cues into conflict for any length of time, in none of the senses, you, you risk a similar thing happening. People get very uncomfortable. It starts becoming very difficult to wear. So that's an important consideration, that things have to be right in the right way, otherwise people get quite ill wearing your stuff. What's it going to run on? I've talked about target platform already, so I won't over-egg that, but there's a whole pyramid of stuff from very cheap processors to desktop computers and mobile phones, and, and whether battery life is a consideration, blah, 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 blah. And finally, who is the customer? Because there's a lot of people now investing in this technology. There's a lot of people who are still running three or four year research projects they got funding for ages ago, who are still riding this wave before it kind of disappears again for a few more years and re-emerges later in another form, because VR's done that since the early 90s. Um, but there's the education sector. There's experiential media. There's stuff like BBC is doing at the moment with their F3A grant, where they're working to, to try and produce more content in binaural and trying to produce more content that does interesting things with the loudspeakers you have around the home, and they're mixing it up a bit. Um, there's gaming, of course, which is still, still the biggest entertainment sector, um, probably because copyright is much easier to control than in other media. Um, there's cinema, of course, and, and pro audio. Um, and there are certain applications, certain niche applications in pro audio where spatialization systems are useful. For example, you might want to audition in a place which is also a live room, you're recording in a historical venue, or you're mixing in a cupboard because you're in a building in a very expensive area and you don't have room for massive studios or you're, you're trying to do something like Dolby Atmos, which is 24 channels and, and there's only so many places in London that you can put 24 channels in. Um, so, so all of these little niche applications, um, that there are products that might fit that market. So these are all reasons why you might want to roll a spatialization algorithm. Actually, quick show of hands, is anybody actually working on a spatialization algorithm or have they in the past worked on one? So that's well over a dozen people, probably about 20. Um, I feel intimidated now. It's great. We can have a fight at the end. Um, I've done this a few times, but only in a very modest way. I've maybe designed four or five systems, and I've shipped two commercial products based on those. And they've both been at the kind of technologically fairly modest end of things. Um, actually, um, war story. Um, when I started out, a head tracker looked like this. This is something the University of Surrey bought me in 1999. And it was in the days before USB. Remember the days before USB? RS-232 and a 9-volt battery, power and data. Um, I, this had to be strapped to the top of people's headphones. And in order to keep the headphones on, they had to wear a John McEnroe-style headband that left an imprint in them after they'd done the test. They didn't like me very much. Um, this is what I'm working on at the moment. There's, most of this is embroidery hoop, and there are three little chips on here. And those three little chips convey about twice as much data as that used to and cost about a tenth as much. Um, that's where technology has moved, but the maths is bloody difficult. Um, so anyway, this talk concerns. Psychoacoustics and acoustics background is most of what I'm going to talk about because I think that's mostly relevant to most of the people here. Um, scientifically verifiable pointers garnered after doing this a few times. Um, so, so things that are absolutely true and some opinions about crap research and red herrings, and I'll elaborate on what I think crap research is and how it's not actually the researchers who are to blame, but the people who are appropriating their data. And, and red herrings, which are the kind of fashions and fads that come and go, because computational power just increases and you can do things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a useful thing to do. So without any more further ado, that was about 10 minutes of ado, wasn't it? OK. Pretty much any theory about the world works is generated in this way. You start off with a really simple scenario, and you play with it a bit, and you find out where it works, and you find the bits that don't work. And where it doesn't work, you add a bit more sophistication, and you loop and you iterate until you end up with something that's... Was it Pauli who said everything has to... Oh, it's probably Einstein. It's probably everybody. But, um, but um, every theory must be as simple as it needs to be to work and no simpler. Um, and, and there are some fairly complicated theories about the world, but they all tend to evolve in this way. Um, if my talk has a narrative spine, this is it. So let's start with the really simple stuff, um, the, the kind of simple neuropsychology of the human hearing mechanism. And um, we're talking about encoding direction of arrival. So what your brain does with the direct arriving sound 
Um, this gentleman looks a bit like Spock. That wasn't the intention. And that's why he's wearing the wrong color top. But he will appear in, um, in, in further introductory slides. Anyway, cleared up. Encoding direction of arrival. So back in 1907, I think, um, the earliest research in um, cognition, Lord Rayleigh published um, and referred to the duplex theory of sound location. And um, right in the middle of the audio spectrum is about one and a half kilohertz. That's a significant number in, um, in, in spatial audio. Um, below that, you're well below the wavelength of the human head. Um, and you can use time difference unambiguously between two ears, even to a fraction of, um, even to with five or 10 microseconds. Um, your, your brain is able, all, all the best locating brains are able to um, use tiny time differences of that magnitude in order to get some information about the location of the first arriving sound. Um, above the wavelength of the human head, when it becomes an obstacle, two things happen. Firstly, intraoral time differences, because you're dealing with multiple phases of audio, no longer unambiguously point to a single area in space. So they don't work so well anymore. The second thing is the acoustic shadow that's cast by the head starts to be a thing. So below about one and a half kilohertz, sound just diffracts around the head and it acts like it's not there. Above about one and a half kilohertz, you get shadowing effect. So the nearby ear that's closer to the sound tends to, um, tends that you get, the signal tends to increase in amplitude because sound is bouncing off the head. And on the far ear, sound is shadowed by the head, so it decreases in amplitude, and you can start using those level differences. A very interesting thing happens in the middle, which is nothing bloody works at all. Um, this octave is troublesome. It's troublesome for two reasons. The first is if you, um, if you start to work out what's happening in loudspeaker stereo with your plus and minus 30 degree loudspeakers. Um, and you sum the signals at the ears, and you work out what's going on from a psychoacoustic point of view. Everything checks out very nicely, and stereo works at low frequencies. And the same is true at high frequencies. In the middle, things no longer sum properly. So actually, loudspeaker stereo doesn't work around somewhere between um, 1 to 3 kilohertz. It doesn't work very well at all. If you ban limit sounds and start trying to pan them, stuff falls apart. It doesn't pan properly anymore. The second thing that happens is that you're in this weird uncanny valley when it comes to um, when it comes to neuroscience, where the neurons stop being able to phase lock to the fine detail of audio signals, so the time differences no longer work properly, and the frequency isn't high enough for level differences to work properly. So um, try and avoid that area if you're doing anything precise in terms of panning. It, um, human, humans just cannot localize very well in that octave at all, between about 1 kilohertz and 2 kilohertz. So um, the 110-year-old duplex theory still holds true in most other circumstances, and we've kind of we learned a lot about it in the intervening 110 years. But um, let's just talk about what happens. So interval time differences, um, small timing differences between time of arrival. Um, and I'm going to start opening a can of worms in a minute, because as soon as you start talking about head-related transfer functions and the, the, things that happen, the, the things that the head does to an acoustic signal and how you might process those in an artificial way, um, stuff starts to get controversial. But let's start talking about it anyway. If the head isn't there, um, the median male human head ear separation is 152 millimeters. That's a spec they build crash test dummies to. And that's why that's a spec that original dummy heads are made using. And for some reason, the 152 millimeters have become a kind of law in this field. Um, most dummy heads are built with that kind of dimension. Um, six inches, maybe seven inches, but somewhere between 150 and 160 millimeters. Uh, the path difference between A and B to signals arriving infinitely far away at the ears is about 440 microseconds maximally. Of course, if you stick a head in the way, then one of the signals has to take the long path around the head, and the other one doesn't. So this 152 millimeters looks more like about 220, um, about 640 microseconds. And actually, if you avoid the kind of sexual tyranny of the median male and you start looking at actual data from actual people, you'll find that it doesn't vary that much. Um, this is some data taken from a, a sample done by some researchers where they covered about 60 um, individual head-related transfer functions and measured them. But the range of data is about 580 to about 720 microseconds. So, so typically, um, this long path distance is between about 20 and 24 centimeters, or if you're American, I can't help you while I'm presenting, but I'm sure you can work it out. It's eight, eight to 10 inches-ish. Um, so, so 
there you go, that's the typical range of data. And there are variants, so there might be something to be said for customizing, um, customizing what you're doing to different sized heads, certainly. So we can talk about level difference now, because this is a much more thorny subject, as it's frequency dependent. Um, here's some old data from 1994. I hope you can see those wiggly lines, but um, this is a signal that is recorded at an ear canal buried deep within a dummy head from 90 degrees nearby, so from the left, when the signal is from the left. And this is what happens at the other ear at the same time. Um, the first thing you'll notice about these is they're horribly peaky, because they have the ear canal response built in. This stuff generally needs some kind of pre-equalization before you can use it. The second thing you might notice is even at low frequencies, there's a disparity. Now, that's just caused by the fact that you can't get an infinite distance away from a dummy head. So that's just caused by the fact that one ear is geographically nearer the loudspeaker than the other ear. Um, these things and other things sort of need to be taken into account. This is all a bit kind of um, reflecty around here, so that stuff gets tidied up. All kind of commercially available head-related transfer function libraries tend to be equalized, and I did this one myself, and this is what stuff looks like after you've equalized it. So the ear canal response goes. How you equalize these things, that's the, um, that's the subject of a paper, and actually I wrote one, so you can find it somewhere. Uh, there's an AES paper about how you do this kind of treatment and how you do the equalization. It's, it's fun. But you can see um, at high frequencies, you've got this disparity of about 15 decibels between, um, caused by the acoustic shadow of the head. Um, low frequencies is pretty much omnidirectional. And you have this transition region about 1K where the level differences aren't really enough to do anything with. Um, so that's good. Um, if stuff, this stuff is arriving from near the edge of your field of, um, your field of audition, it's quite easy to put it into a, into a spatial context in your mind, just using level differences. Things get more complicated if you're doing stuff like, is it coming from the front or is it coming from the back? And I know this because I put these figures up myself, but the higher of the two here is stuff coming from the front, so you get a bit of resonance at really high frequencies where old people can no longer hear, caused by uh, resonances coming from the fine detail of the outer ear. So the, so the little folds in your outer ear cause this little lift here in the top octave. Um, if your top octave is shot and you're above the age of about 55, or for some people, 40, um, all you've got to go on is this stuff here. Um, interpersonal variation, then, becomes quite a significant part of, um, part of how this works. And um, if, you're dealing, if you're listening to somebody else's dummy head, that stuff no longer works particularly well. So these frequencies here can change a bit. You've got a little bit of level difference, but not much to go on. Um, there are other mechanisms that you can use, but um, front-back discrimination is quite hard from a dummy head, and it's one of the classic problems of, of this kind of audio. Here is a lovely diagram. It's lovely because I made it. Um, of the, all, the, all of the head-related transfer functions in the horizontal plane put into a frequency plot and, and, and warped around and shown in two colors. So you can see some sort of classic features. and That, that notch there, that blue line up in front, is... Um, is, is something that is often character, used to characterize particular head-related transfer functions. That frequency changes, generally depending on the size of larger details of the body, so the torso and the shoulders and so on. Um, it gets quite wiggly at the sides and gets quite high in level at the um, side nearest the ear and quite low in level at the side furthest from the ear. And um, Otherwise, there isn't that much to go on. Things get quite interesting in the vertical plane when you're trying to simulate elevated sources because... Um, you can't use interval time difference because it's pretty much zero if the source is in front and you're lifting it above the head and you're lift, making it go behind the head. Interval time difference will stay at zero under those circumstances. So how do you simulate a lifted source? Well, the only thing that human beings can use, there are two things they can use. The first is this little, reflect, this little spike here, and that's reflection from your shoulders. And the second thing is this massive resonant peak there at seven kilohertz, which comes from... Um, which come from the conch, the, the main fold in the bottom of the ear. It's called conch resonance. Um, if you look at different head-related transfer functions, that frequency shifts around between about 6 and 8 kilohertz, which, again, is not part of the auditory spectrum to which people have much, verbal, uh, much, much audio acuity. Um, it's a very weak cue, and it's crap, and um, we're just not very good at perceiving elevated sources unless we can move our heads and use head movements to disambiguate. Um, and very often, and I've heard of some spatialization algorithms that just ignore the vertical plane completely and simply put a, a, a massive 
boost filter in at about six kilohertz to simulate an elevated source. So it's a fragile queue. It's a bit rubbish. Um, and it's not something that many people find particularly convincing, especially if the dummy head that's being used to make the recording is somewhat different from their own. So here's a whole collection of um, head-related transfer functions taken from individuals. This is a much less lovely diagram, you'll notice, um, sorted for some reason by the notch frequency. Um, and you'll see that the shapes are, fit, uh, are fairly consistent between different listeners. Um, but, but what changes is the details where those particular frequencies are. And it depends on sizes of ear features and head features and all, all manner of things. But it's all about, um, it's all about scale, really. So I'm going to start talking now about individualized head-related transfer functions. Now, individualized means different things to different people. That's why it's individual. But um, if, if my wife was sitting in the front row, she'd be telling me to slow down. So I'm going to take a breath now. Individualized head-related transfer functions are the efforts to try and customize the thing that you're simulating, the, the, the spatial illusion you're creating to an individual user based on their biometric data. And there's been a bit of a fad for this recently. It's something that's become possible. And because it's a relatively new thing that people have been able to do, it's something that's quite patentable. And so money has been thrown at doing it. Now, whether this is a good thing or not and where you stop is still a matter of contention. Um, so I pulled this off the internet recently, and there is a, a research group who may even be here, so I'm not going to be nasty about what they've done. I think it's incredibly clever. But you can, um, they, they provide a mechanism where you can take a smartphone picture of yourself and it'll extract all the metric information and, and build a virtual dummy ear and bounce sound off it and, um, and use that ear to provide you with a personalized set of head-related transfer functions. And um, what they used to show this is great is that front-back reversals, they tell me, divide by two. And I'm very skeptical about that number there, which is 10%. And precision of vertical sound source localization, again, another bugbear of crapness. That gets better. And the level of externalization, well, how do you measure that? We'll come to that later. That also increases. And this is the point where it's opposite for me to talk about the perils of crap research. Now, peer-reviewed published research is not crap, generally, because it's replicable. The method is laid clear. It's all lovely. What's generally crap is the interpretation of this research. And you have to be very careful in this field, this kind of very complex cognitive field, that you're making the correct assumptions from the research. So the first thing I'd say that people get wrong is that perception is horrendously complex. So a lot of experimentation, particularly in the 70s and 80s when a lot of pioneering work was done, um, takes a couple of these cues and gets rid of the others. So if you were to try and approximate how the human auditory system in a natural environment like this actually puts sound in context and listens to reflections and, 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 and learns where things are coming from and, and, and all the attributes about spatial audio, if you took that apart, you'd find that visual cues are somewhat the strongest cue. Um, you could, your, your whole auditory sensation might not work. You might be deaf in one ear. Um, and even if you're not, what's happening visually, where I'm standing on the stage, for example, will give you a very valuable cue as to where the sound is coming from. And typically, you can throw a completely different set of data at the ears, and the sound will still, and the, and the visual sense will still dominate. So actually, our strongest cue is visual, which is quite depressing. Um, and it means that people have to have to be in with you when it comes to suspending disbelief. Um, second thing is head movement feedback, which kind of refers to all of this stuff. But if people are in an environment where they can move their head and the sound field changes commensurately, then all the stuff like front back confusion, elevation confusion, that all goes away. Because your, your body and your mind are using tan theta and cos theta somewhere to, to disambiguate. Interval time difference is dominant over interval level difference, because generally it's more consistent. Um, a priori knowledge. If you have somebody speaking to you who's, with whose voice you are familiar, you know what level it comes out of their mouth. You generally know what the spectrum is. You, you, you can, be very familiar, you can um, infer quite a lot about where it's coming from and what it's doing. Same if you're a musician and you play an instrument a lot and you hear a very familiar instrument, you'll know an awful lot about it, an awful lot more than a non-musician. Um, direct to reverberant comparison. You can listen to the reverb coming at you as a separate object and look at its coloration and infer something from the sound source about that, particularly whether it's real or whether it's not. Um, and monaural analysis. So even if one of your ears doesn't work, you can still use something about the intensity levels in your other ear to, to ascertain something about where a sound is coming from. 
So this whole pyramid of things, and probably some other things as well, go into, um, go into how people hear. And um, at the top there is the strongest cue and approximately going down to the weakest cue. Now, a lot of the research data that was collected while this pioneering effort was done tends to consider only a single reflection, tends to use very contrived stimuli, because there wasn't much processing power, they're not trying to reconstruct a sound field, they're just trying to play a direct sound that somebody manipulated in a really horrible way where they pan level one way and they pan, pan intensity the other way and they try and bring the sound from one side of the head using one method back to the other side of the head or something like that. It's, um, it's research, but what, what you can infer about it from how the human auditory system works is very, very limited because we're not just kind of weighted adders here. Um, if you throw some stimuli away, the way that you engage with what's left of the world changes substantially. And you can't really play that game and infer robust conclusions about how cognition works. You can only really learn a little bit about how the very, how the very outer layer of neuroscience works. Um, this is a lot of text. But this came from a paper in the 1990s, quite a well-known paper about um, human localization. And they were trying to find out how time and intensity differences trade off. And it's just a little bit, a paragraph in the paper that's quite telling about the limitations of this research. And the researchers put it in there because they knew that what they were doing wasn't particularly natural, wasn't particularly nice for the test subjects, but they had to do it. So um, it was expected, they're panning stuff using time one way and level the other. It was expected in the case of unnatural combinations of that way. The auditory event was split up into two components. So that's what happens. You pan one way and you pan the other way using a different technique and the sound sort of loses fusion and you end up with one image stuck in one ear and one image stuck in another ear because nobody ever listens to sounds like that. It's a very unnatural thing to do. You have no database. The subjects were instructed to describe positions of both auditory events if they were able to distinguish between them. Moreover, they were asked to describe the loudness distribution of the two images in terms of a pair of numbers like 60% to 40%. You are asking a lot of your listeners you're asking them to suspend disbelief, to know that it's not sounding right, to know that these cues are unnatural, but to kind of make the best of them. Um, there, there were, these, these are really hard limitations to research. If you, were, if you were reading this as somebody's method for selling a product, you'd go, now hang on a bloody minute. But um, this, ends up in the, this ends up in the kind of codex of stuff that's known about, about cognition. Um, and so things might not necessarily be useful just because you can do them. The second thing is interactive, because I know we've all eaten and thus... If you don't have a massive adrenaline rush like me, you're probably falling asleep. It is a short distance between imperceptible and intolerable. Now, I've said that because um, there's a scale here that is often used to analyze the quality of a, of a bitrate reduction codex. So MPEG was designed using this kind of thing, where you impair audio in some way, and you ask listeners whether this impairment is imperceptible, so they can't tell the difference between that and unprocessed audio, or or how aggrieved they are about the change, down to very annoying. Um, so quite a lot of bitrate reduction techniques. DAB was designed in this way. MPEG was designed in this way. Um, and a lot of impairments are measured on this kind of scale, where you ask subjects what they think about what you've done. And um, it's fine, but it does have limitations. And I would argue that it's a very short step from, um, from imperceptible to annoying. And this is an example from my own life that's a little bit interactive. Um, this is Senate House, obviously, because the sign says it is. This is the administrative, um, administrative center of the University of Surrey, a university with about 15,000 people in it when I was there. So fairly big. It's a seven-story building. All the great and good of the university's senior administrative team walk in and out of that door. And for at least 15 years, this sign was there. Now, if you know anything about typography, you might be clenching your teeth. Um, and uh, at some point, I was co-writer of, of a satirical university magazine, it was quite short-lived, as these enterprises often are. But it was a slow news day, so I did a spot the difference and corrected the typographical errors on this sign. Um, so here's a spot the difference competition. There are four things that are wrong with this sign in the top image that are corrected in the bottom image. And I, I put this online for a while, so um, if you can spot one, just shout it out. Yeah, great. I think we've got them all. Okay, so um, the capital H is upside down. The S is upside down. And the serif here is um, missing. Um, it is, there's an extra serif on the U, and one missing on the N, which means that they've swapped the U and the N around. And if you know a bit about how fonts work, it's quite horrible to see the one at the top. So um, nobody noticed this. I pointed it out in a, in, a, in, a, in a thing online that nobody really read. And the responses coming back were going, hmm, this is subtle. I've so forced scored nil, and it's taken them about an hour to see them all. 
someone had to blow it up in Photoshop and was complaining about the resolution of photos. So this, people found this quite difficult, and I was thinking, is this just me? But actually, over that summer, somebody paid to have the sign corrected. <laughs> and this has been there for 15 years. Um, so as soon as things are pointed out to people, it doesn't matter how subtle they are, they might be aggrieved by what they've lost. And this is probably why DAB sounds awful. The tests are fine on the, con on the concocted material, but as soon as you start playing real-world examples through it and people have to live with it, they might be a bit more aggrieved. So um, it's just something to look out for in listening tests and something to look out for in research. Um, so let's go back to this. We've done direction of arrival. Um, there's a lot more going on that the human auditory system is dealing with. So let's start talking about encoding early reflections. And now, and now Spock in the wrong shirt is being assaulted by early reflections. I like this. This comes from a Paul White article from Sound on Sound. And it's a fairly typical exposition of how reverb works. Um, you've got the direct sound. And a few milliseconds later, you have these early reflections obediently decaying in a log curve. And then, and then here, you've got these late arriving reflections at a certain time. And you can tell they're late arriving reflections rather than early ones because they're a different color. And, um, and that's great because um, sound changes color at a certain point. Um, of course, sound fields don't work like this. I've done it. This is, this is um, another one of the outputs from bits of software I've written in the past. Um, so here is a person and a loudspeaker. And I've tilted the room a little bit just to try and make the, things, uh, make, make the reflections a little less regimented. Um, but the first reflections come from the, these are reflections off the back wall and off the ceiling. And you can see the loudspeakers rotated because the angle between them and the listener is different. So directivity is important. But, but you see where the reflections are, the color code if you're an electronic engineer, it's the same as a resistor color code. So it's the order of reflection. So yellow is four. That's the fourth order reflection of four walls and so on. But anyway, um, and, and the calibration thing, I'm explaining a diagram. This is in meters. So 10 meters is about 30 milliseconds multiplied by three, and you get the amount of time delay. So I'm showing you about the first 60 milliseconds of what happens. Um, let's zoom out a bit. Um, and you can end up modeling quite easily a quarter of a million reflections if you're doing a second long impulse response. Um, Things build up gradually. Um, you can see that quite clearly. There's this kind of rhythm in this, which is a real pain in the ass if you're trying to do convolutional reverb, because you can hear that, that pattern of rhythm unless you do something about it. But there's no massive sudden change from what looks like early reflections to what looks like late reflections. So it's nothing to do with room acoustics. There's two reasons why we have this diagram with the reverb changing color. The first is from a DSP point of view. Algorithms are written like this because you can't simulate late arriving energy in the same way as early arriving energy because of computational power and because of the way you have to mush it up a bit so you don't get this kind of regimented pattern of flutter. You have to use some different algorithms. So the knobs in plugins tend to do different things to late and early energy. The second thing is there is something psychological going on. Um, there's some, again, this research goes back to the 1950s but, but, comes, but, but has been added to over time. Effect of a single reflection in orchestral music after Baron and Marshall. Um, at this, at this point, but before about a millisecond, if sound arrives within the same millisecond as the direct sound, you get this thing called additive localization where the brain just takes the average of the two times, and that's kind of the direction where the sound is perceived to be coming from. After this, some kind of hardwired neurological mechanism kicks in from probably hundreds of thousands of years of living in caves and enclosures. This thing is quite advanced and, and, and wired quite early in. This is kind of being used to listening in rooms. Um, the late arriving energy is suppressed by, something, by some low-level neural hardware. And that mechanism starts to wear off. Uh, you get a bit of image shift, but it's not additive. It's not pulled in the same way. It adds maybe 5 or 10 degrees of blur to whatever you're listening to. Uh, and, then that, and then it kind of tops out. Um, after this five milliseconds, something else happens, and another echo suppression mechanism kicks in. This one's a bit higher level. This one can be put under conscious control. This is the one where if somebody changes a reverb, you, you, you're, you're able to get accustomed to a new room, but it takes you a few seconds, and your neural circuitry is reconfiguring to deal with a new room. Um, that adds some tone coloration, which is good, because it tells you what kind of room you're in. And um, if stuff arrives later or is particularly loud and level, um, the researchers call it echo disturbance. What I will call that is reverb as an object. What you hear is no longer fused with the direct sound. It's this kind of different package of stuff, reverb as a separate object. You're listening to the reverb as reverb. Um, so early reflections do a few things to sound. 
The first thing they do is blur the image. Now, if you're advertising your spatialization algorithm based on really, really sharp image ability, what you actually want to do to make the perceived quality better is immediately blur that image. You want to lose that acuity because, um, because a lot of um, auditorium acoustics literature tells you that um, people perceive this image. The greater the image blur, the greater the perceived quality of a space you're modeling. You don't want to have too sharp image ability. Second thing it adds is some externalization, so stuff sounds like it's coming out of your head at last, and some distance, so distance perception is strongly reliant on these early reflections being there. Aspects of rim size and loudness, now that comes from, that comes from early and late reflections. And this, um, this kind of thing where reverb starts to become an object in its own right very much depends on the kind of program material you're listening to. If you're listening to drums because they're so impulsive, it might be as low as about 20 milliseconds, but for most music with its lower onsets and with um, longer sustain, it tends to be between about 50 and 80 milliseconds. Um, so reverb as its own sound is the next thing. After 50 milliseconds, you get this kind of, you hear this kind of package of reverb coming from the center of gravity of the room. Um, if you've got a door open into a much live, live, live ambience, you can hear this reverb, and it's psychologically coupled with the door. So we go back to this diagram again. It's all the energy that's arriving beyond this, this 20 line here is really kind of cognitively later reflections. What happens when a sound bounces off a wall? Um, you, get a bit of, um, you get a bit of heat loss from porous absorption. Um, you get a specular reflection, specular like a mirror. Um, and you get this scattering, which becomes more and more important the higher the order of the reflection where um, things, don't, things don't bounce, they're kind of misted up a bit. Uh, and mistiness, a kind of foggy mirror would be the visual equivalent. And you also get this sort of panel reactance. If you were modeling a, a, a real surface, you would, it would have an impulse response of a certain length. And all these things happen in a room, and they're very hard to model, um, especially using the classic mechanisms for, um, for modeling sources. So really, you don't want to model those late reflections individually, firstly, because they take far too bloody long to do. And secondly, because, um, and secondly, because it just doesn't sound right if you try and model them um, individually. So a good approach is to model them individually, know they sound awful, look at the coloration, and then find some kind of statistical method for doing it, like the standard kind of Schroeder Moore filters or diffuse networks or any kind of technology for doing reverb that exists these days. Good reverb algorithms actually tend to be nonlinear. They allow a bit of modulation to what they're doing. Um, and that's not happening in real rooms, but you need that because your ears need some kind of decorrelation and it sounds much better. So at that point, what you're trying to do in terms of realism deliberately breaks down. So later reflection, to get the feeling of being present in a room, which you don't get if you deny people these late reflections. So you need reverb, and you need to add it even if your source material already has it. Externalization and distance again, front back discrimination of familiar sounds. So using this top octave or the top two octaves of the, human hearing um, of the human hearing, if it's a familiar sound and it's modeled well, you can compare it with the coloration of the reverb. And you know that if the top end's a bit high, it's probably coming from the front. And if the top end of the direct sound's a bit low, it's probably coming from the back. So that's a useful little cue, but it's a subordinate one. And aspects of room size and loud liveness again. And now I want to talk about something that's often neglected from, um, from decent algorithms, and, and that's source directivity. And you neglect it at your peril because not all sound sources are the same, and they can't be modeled using just standard omni or cardioid techniques. Here is a loudspeaker. I did all this stuff at Focusrite about, God, about eight years ago, so I'm, I'm sorry about the quality of the diagram. But what you can see here is um, um, the characteristic kind of directivity plot. This was probably sampled at 15 degrees, so it looks a lot smoother than it actually was. One thing you'll see is characteristic of a loudspeaker plot is this little groove here. And that groove tells you how big the loudspeaker is. So um, if you take 1.7 kilohertz, that's a high, high, half wavelength at four inches, um, because you get phase cancellation. This part of the drive is pushing. This part of the drive is pushing. And by the time you're looking at 90 degrees, they're completely out of phase with one another, and they cancel. And they don't cancel completely, because you've got a bit from the middle as well. But, but loudspeaker directivity responses look a bit like a porcupine, because you have this kind of acoustic comb filter. Um, at the back here, you have this characteristic roll-off caused by the size of the cabinet. So the cabinet is casting an acoustic shadow in exactly the same way the team and head would. You may get panel resonances, which is why there's a bit of a lift here, because you get energy radiating out of the back. So the bandwidth here is a little higher than the bandwidth here, where you're at a corner. Um, but that's kind of fairly typical. 
the, um, the frontal response looks not too objectionable and everything else. You can tell a lot about a loudspeaker. You can hear these things, and, 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 and they matter. They're what make loudspeakers sound like loudspeakers. They're what makes... Um, I was at Music Messer about five years ago in the hall with all, of the, um, with all of the loudspeakers and the PA systems, and somebody I couldn't see took a trumpet out of their bag and started playing it. And you immediately know, despite the fact there are thousands of manufacturers selling you tens of thousands of loudspeakers, that it's a real sound source. Right? We've got a long way to go as an industry. And one of the reasons is because loudspeakers put a, an acoustic imprint on the directional sound they put out. And most of what you hear comes from the back and the sides of the loudspeaker. So they end up making your room artificially bassy just because they are objects that is, they, they are physical objects and they generally tend to be quite big. If you change that four inch bass driver to a 10 inch bass driver, two things happen. This notch frequency moves down. I don't know who designed this loudspeaker. Well, I think I do, but I'm not going to indict them. But you can see the harmonics of this dip. And right up to 2K, a 10 inch driver is producing measurable acoustics um, on the audio. So the crossover frequency is way too bloody high and it's a crime against humanity, only a small one. Um, it's a bigger object, so the roll-off here is much lower. Um, a musket sounds different from a cannon, despite the fact the acoustics are the same, because they are different sizes. We won't talk about a high-velocity rifle. They go supersonic, and they create a boom. But generally, big things and small things sound very different from one another, despite the fact the physics is the same. And it's just because you can hear that. You can hear that acoustic footprint a million miles away. Um, here's, a, here's data about a real singer, and you can see that stuff goes from being only at low frequencies to being quite directional and cardioid at high frequencies. What you don't see in real, uh, gem, real acoustic sources generally is this piston thing because generally the, the sound coming out of the center of an organic object tends to move faster than the sound coming out of the sides. So you don't get this big kind of, you don't get a homogeneously moving piston in the same way that you do with, um, you do with loudspeakers. But you can see above about one and a half kilohertz, funnily enough, diameter of a human head, um, things go from being omnidirectional to being cardioid. So, um, so real-life acoustic sources don't look like loudspeakers, and that's one of the reasons why you have to get them right in the simulation if you want things to sound natural. Most of what you hear in any simulation is going to be reverb. It's going to be late-arriving energy, and that's going to colour your sound. So to sum up that little slide, um, things that colour reverb, you've got the piston phase effect, so you can see the notches and the boosts caused by this anti-phase problem. The acoustic shadow cast by the source itself. And you've got resonances if you're trying to keep sound contained in a box where the box rattles in spite of you and panels move and you get radiation coming out of the back and sides that sounds like it's being played through a lump of wood. If you listen to any Phil Spector recordings, I know he's in prison now, but he did make some in the 60s. One of the techniques he liked to use in music production was to, um, was to bounce stuff back off a tape play it through a loudspeaker in a studio and record it again to capture the ambience of that loudspeaker. And that's the reason why a lot of his songs sound like they're being played through a sock. If you do that, you're catching a lot of bass because loudspeakers have a, a very poor directional response. And the more you bounce, the more high frequency you lose, and you can't just equalize it out because then the direct sound sounds quite objectionably, um, quite objectionably tinny. And so he lived with it. But, um, but that's why a lot of that music... The backing tracks these days sound like they've been, they've been rolled off at about two kilohertz because acoustically most of the energy has. So um, that's a good time to do a summary. I might have to field some questions, but I hope you're still awake. Um, what did I say? What did I say? It's a good thing I got this up here, isn't it? So to slow down again, computational virtual reality has four components, not necessarily in the real world, but the computational stuff does. You've got your time and level cues, that you need to get right. You need a decent database of well-equalized head-related transfer functions. Um, you might want to customize them slightly, or you might not. It depends. Early reflections. Late arriving reverb as its own object, which is generally rendered differently. And source directivity, which is an important component, as I've said. Um, Pre-equalize your reverb. The above is for mathematical and psychological convenience. It is not a law of nature. Uh, as we've seen, there's nothing in the acoustics that dictates this. It's just about the way that the human echo suppression mechanic, uh, it, the spongy circuitry in the brain works. And it's about the way that um, things are convenient when that meets digital signal processing. So it's, it's really a, a convenience of ours, and it's not a law of nature that these four components are different. Use different techniques for early and late reflections. I've said that, haven't I? And reflections are really important, so is directivity. Care about them both, or your model will sound rubbish. Um, 
And a lot of models out there sound rubbish now. And nobody knows it because they haven't heard a good one. How to do crap research. OK. If you want to, if you want to misappropriate research, um, restrict the brain's access to cues deliberately. So give them only a little bit of the information they would hear if they were listening naturally. Create those stimuli and extrapolate far too far from those conclusions when you've limited somebody's ability to understand what's going on. Uh, second thing you need to do is completely ignore or misunderstand another author's assumptions when they've done a similar test and over-apply their findings to, um, to, a, to, to a far too great level. Underestimate the human auditory system. The more you try and scrutinize a thing, the more horrendously complicated it is. Um, bits of it are obviously kind of low-level neural wiring. Some bits of it are slightly under conscious control. Some bits of it are entirely under conscious control. You can willingly shift your attention from one part of, a, one part of what you're hearing to another. Um, and all of this stuff is, is very difficult if you're an experimenter. Um, what else did I say? The other way to do crap research. Oh, yes, impairment ranking experiments. So um, when you're trying to work out how aggrieved people are when you take away detail in your simulation, fully believe that they're able to understand and grasp the impairments on your concocted material before they've actually gone away and listened to your product and had to live with it. That's crap research. It's great, isn't it? I mean, you have to do something. You have to be able to evaluate anything new. But you shouldn't assume that just because listeners say it's OK, once it gets out into the real world, it will be OK. There needs to be another stage of evaluation when people have to live with your stuff. So the antidote to crap research. In the research stage, try and make stimuli complete and consistent. We can now. We've got the computing power. We have plugins you can just download and use for free. And there's no reason to, to deny people what might be natural stimuli. Ask listeners if they're uncomfortable or frustrated or in difficulty, because there's a lot of these experiments where, where the poor test subjects have a disastrous time trying to do what you're telling them to do. And they report how difficult it's been, and you just go, yeah, but I need a bloody publication. And so you ignore it. Um, if people are in difficulty, it's worth writing a paragraph, as you see in good research, about how people found it difficult, because it tells you something about neuroscience. It might be that you're asking them to do something they can't actually do. And then interview outliers rather than ignoring them. So you will always find in any pool of 20 subjects that four or five of them will be telling you something very different from the other 15. Um, that's great. That information you need to capture and you need to work out why. I think it's just as important as the rest of the publication where you crop the outliers and make your regression lines nice and neat. Individualized HRTFs mean different things. It's sometimes worth the effort. It depends what you're doing, how much trouble you're trying to go to, what your investors are trying to tell you to sell. And sometimes it's not worth the effort. Um, the answer is very much it depends. But certainly, put the facility into customized HRTFs to, to a limited extent, because it's easy to do. Um, and, and some people just listen to these simulations and all they hear are elevated sources because their heads are quite big. And I know quite a few people with big heads, and they're, they're good test subjects. All research starts as anecdote, as I have said before. Um, understand the background, but also trust your instincts. These are things I didn't actually say, but I try to say. Uh, dog food your own product. Work out whether it tastes good or not. Uh, and, and trust your own instincts as well as those of your test subjects, because having complete knowledge about what's going on at the nuts and bolts level is as much of an advantage as it is an impairment. Um, you have to ship a product, so you can't think of forever, but you will have a good instinct for when things aren't right. Make it cheap to try different things in your code. Customize HRTFs. What do you have to lose? Make, make the directivity able to change and process it offline and listen to if it sounds different. You don't have to make it work in real time. And respect Gestalt. Now, I, I probably should have taken that out of my talk, because I have done a whole talk about acoustics without using the word Gestalt. But if you know what it is, respect it. Exercises for the listener. So provocative questions to end this with, because I've got a room full of spatial audio people. B-format ambisonic filters of the kind that were patented by Dolby and Lake DSP about 20 years ago. They never work as well as dummy head recordings. I don't know if anybody else can support my claim, but this is my finding. Um, why is that? There must be some reasons why. And it's either to do with mathematical approximation or acoustic approximation, but dummy head recordings are very satisfying in comparison. Um, this is just a personal gripe. Um, this, is, this is a real pig. Um, there's six axes of accelerometer on this, and gyroscopes, and magnetometers. And you've got to combine this data to work out what the attitude is of a head. And it's, it's one of the hardest problems in control theory. There's Kalman filters there. There's offset correction going on. There's a lot of real-time trigonometry in three and sometimes four dimensions. And it's, it's bloody horrible. If anybody knows an easy way to do it, do let me know. Um, provocative question. <laughs>
What? Oh, okay, I'll look at that. Somebody else's, though, isn't it? Much more fun to make your own until, obviously, you're paying for your own time. Um, and um, a final provocation. I've seen this technology rise and fall on at least two previous occasions, and it looks like it's now going to disappear as a novelty for perhaps a third time in my experience. What often helps new technology to fail is a lack of engagement with content creators from the start. There is not very much software that, that is a must-have from a spatial audio perspective. Designed to listen on headphones, really good experience, something that somebody creative has engaged with from the start. And I think one of the reasons these things keep disappearing is because the tools are an absolute pig to use. The plugins just are quite unreliable or they're designed by engineers for engineers. Um, I think there needs to be, if you want to see this technology succeed, and Dolby is kind of showing the way at the moment, but, but re a real and proper effort to, to engage content creators and make the kind of tools they want to use in order to see this stuff thrive in the future. And quite by accident, I think I've run to time. So thank you very much. And if this fails as a head tracker, next year I'll be selling a tambourine. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ben. That was, that was absolutely awesome. I think you've probably scared half the people off ever touching yes. um, anything to do with this subject ever again. And Mission maybe inspired the other half to do another 100 or so specialization algorithms. Um, it is uh, hard. We, but we, we're a little bit over time. Let's take a couple of quick questions, because I'm sure there are some. I wasn't that comprehensive. What do you think? Oh. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> what do you think, or what's your opinion about optimization or generalization of HRTFs into spherical transfer functions? I've not tried it myself, I, I, but, but from what I can see, things like principal component analysis and spherical harmonics, it's quite promising. I think it will work. As long as you do your groundwork carefully, I'm a big fan of uh, non-individualized, good general libraries of HRTFs. They have a lot to say. So keep at it. Thank you. Another question? That's right. It's, it's more for the room than anyone else. Um, I'm a, a jazz musician, and I had a friend who used to work for Lake DSP, and he made headphone spatial stuff. And I'm just wondering if someone makes a VST instrument that will put musicians who are recording in a room so they can play together. So when you're a jazz musician and you're recording, it's very hard to play in time with headphones because it's just completely yeah. opposite experience of doing gigs. So you've got latency as an issue there as well. Just that the, your, your sound's bouncing back and the other musician's sound's coming back. Everything's, when you're playing live, everything's arriving at different times. Mm. And you, you, if you're a jazz musician, you really want to play yes. together. But it's very hard in the studio. That is a hard problem to solve. And this it would be very hard with this technology as well because you've got the kind of liveness of it to worry about. Um, I'm sure it's possible. I'll give it some thought. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to find some sectors. You for just want a two. You want two tracks of stereo coming back that the engineer can feed to the musicians, mm. or, or one for you know a different tr different okay. two track for each person. Well, do you, the thing is, do you need do you need proper spatialization for that if it's just for kind of live comfort monitoring? Well, you can use a reverb, but I just think it'd be nice if you had. If, each, if you could, the band in a room and, and everyone had a different perspective okay. based on where well, they were in the room. There. <laughs> I'll bear yeah. it in mind. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. I'll try to make it quick. Thanks for the talk, it was great. Um, thank you. Our question is um, with sources, um, they're not only uh, directional, but we have also distributed sources like yes. grand pianos or a, mm -hmm. a bass. And what would be your uh, approach to combine those with, uh, I don't know, classical my, uh, methods like impulse responses, or how do you combine a, a big source with, okay. uh, yeah. Um, well, those things would need to be recorded in stereo to start with, because you have something different happening. I, it's a physically wide object, so you have some phase properties. If you're not recording in stereo, then you need to do something to make it to, uh, some kind of pseudo stereo. And you can just use almost like a loudspeaker stereo algorithm, so you can have the left and right extent of a wide source just kind of marked and, and play two slightly different decorrelated signals. And that's quite a good approximation. The only other thing you can do to give your source width is just to make sure the early reflections are supporting it, because that contributes to a sensation of source width. Okay. We're
We're uh, really close to time now, so we'll have to call it, call it a day there. I just wish I'd seen this talk earlier, because then we could have put your, the letters of your name upside down in the program. <laughs> but uh, thank, well, thanks once again to Ben. And uh, I'm sure any more questions, he's, he'll be around. So thanks, thanks Ben. Thank you very much.